Welcome to Consulting Mastery, where we help B2B consultants master the business of consulting. I'm Carrie, And I'm Ahmed. Join us as we explore the art of delivering outstanding client value, earning a higher income, and thriving in today's marketplace. So here's a controversial topic that you and I have not discussed in advance. So we're going to see how this goes. Oh boy. Okay. I'm ready. Lay it on me. Consultants live and die by their results. True or false? True. I not agree. Controversial. Not controversial enough, <laughs> but yes, hundred percent true. Well, here's a controversy. So if, if consultants live and die by their results, which I don't think everyone listening here is necessarily sold on. So we'll need to talk about that more. But if you agree with that, Second statement, consultants control the results of their clients, true or false? Ah, that's a tricky one. And I'm not sure which side of the fence I will land on. I'm going to say it's true and false. How's that? Okay. How's it true and how's it false? So to be fair, I'll, I'll, I'll walk that back a bit and, and be a bit more specific. Um, it is true to the extent that you've put yourself in a scenario where you have, you know, reduced enough of the variables and risks that you are confident that your client is going to get results. So, you know, where I think that falls apart is where you walk into an engagement knowing that the resource isn't there, that the company hasn't bought in, you know, that the stakeholders are not connected to the, to the, um, the work that's being done. So, you know, the reality is done properly. Yes. Control the results, 100%. Where it falls apart is where the work isn't done in advance to make sure that you're taking on the right work. And that's where people definitely get themselves into trouble. But even then, even in that, even in your first scenario where, okay, Carrie, I've, I've vetted the deal, right? Everybody's in. All the stakeholders are on board from the, the board level down to the people that are doing the work on the street level, right? Everybody's all, all on, on side. There's still risk. Yes. Because there's external factors that neither you nor the client can control that may affect the outcome of the work. Absolutely. Also, the minute you walk into work, right? The minute you enter into an engagement believing that you don't have control over the results, then it's quite likely a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like you are immediately giving yourself the out to not deliver the thing that you've walked in to deliver. So I think there's a there's a, a belief that needs to exist there. And yes, reality is going to happen, right? Like we've, you know, we've gone through economic scenarios and pandemics and all sorts of things that that appear out of nowhere or seemingly out of nowhere. Um, but as a consultant who is out in the world selling a solution, I would say you need to be pretty sure <laughs> that you have mitigated for whatever risk you can. So to me, this is the rub, right? This is, I think, the, the, the fundamental challenge of running a consulting business, what I might dub today the consulting conundrum. Okay. Nice. Is that your reputation is tied to your results. So if you walk into a client's organization and they want your help and you can't demonstrate your ability to get results via your track record, I've done this, I've done that, we've got this client, we've got this case study. If you can't demonstrate, depending on the field that you're in, but usually quantifiable results then you're a nobody, then you're, you're cheap, you're common, you're a pair of hands. Because if you can't demonstrate results, then I now as a client see you as just an execution person, as a doer, as an implementation person. And implementation doers are interchangeable and inexpensive. Whereas if you're the brains, if you're the expert who has engineered results for clients in the past, I no longer just need your execution or your hands. I need your brain, your strategy, and that's expensive. However, for the reasons that you just elaborated on, you don't fully control your client results and you can't guarantee anything because there are external factors outside of your control 
and the client's control. In other words, if you do everything right and the client does everything right, you still may not get results. So how do we think about this as a consultant? Yes, I understand that my track record is my business card. I live and die by my results. If I can't demonstrate results, I'm not going to do well. At the same time, I can't necessarily control the outcomes and the results of every single client engagement. So what do we do? Throw our hands up in the air and just move on with life? Or is there a solution here? What do you think? Well, there's definitely a solution. Let's talk through it. So the analogy that I've used in the past that may be objectionable, this is where it gets controversial, <laughs> is that clients are like horses. Okay. And you got to pick your winners. And I see a couple of mistakes that people make. Number one is, first of all, to your point earlier, they don't even go into an engagement with the attitude of their own results. Right? They're, a lot of consultants are very content just delivering inputs and charging for those inputs. And you could make a decent living doing that. You're not going to build a very good business. So that's, that's number one. But secondly, is a lot of clients will concentrate their efforts with a single client or a couple of clients. Like the big whale client is obviously a very common scenario or a couple of clients or two or three clients. And the problem with that is not everyone's going to get outstanding results. You're concentrating your risk in too few scenarios. You're betting on one horse or two horses and you better believe that that horse is going to win the race, i.e. get results to justify that concentration risk. And so what I see is that most consultants are simply not working with enough clients to generate enough winners. And yeah, your clients right now may be getting decent results, but what if you doubled the volume of clients that you were working with? And there's ways to do that without doubling your workload that maybe we don't get into today. But what if you conceivably doubled the number of clients you're working with at any given point in time? Do you think you'd have better odds of getting better results and better case studies with a more diverse group of clients because you're likely the constant in all these relationships, right? You're doing probably the same thing for everybody. And yet some clients get better results than others. It's more about them. They're the variable here that we're isolating for and testing more than you. You see what I'm saying? Well, absolutely. And, and the other thing that what you're saying you know, where that leads to is your ability to have more and more winning horses in the stable, if we stick to the metaphor, right, as you move along. So, you know, figuring out who are the kind of clients and what are the conditions that need to be in place that tip the scales, you know, further in our favor. Because you're going to start to learn, right, as you go through these engagements, you're going to learn that, oh, when A happens, oof, this is a lot tougher, right? Or, you know, when B happens, things run more smoothly and we get better results, generally speaking. So what you can really do with volume and only with volume, right? This doesn't work if you have two clients at a time for, you know, for years on end and then panic when they disappear. But what can happen with the right amount of volume to be clear, we're not saying everyone needs to, you know, have a million clients and, and scale like crazy, but setting yourself up with that diversity also allows you to tune thing, sort of tune in on how you're going to continue to do better moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it always puzzles me why a consultancy would willfully participate <laughs> And a scenario where a single client makes up the majority of their revenue, the whale. I, well, I mean, I, I get why they get stuck in the trap. Go ahead. I was going to say what's especially fascinating about it is most of our clients have left a job, right? They decided that or, you know, whatever circumstances decided that the job is not the thing they wanted. So then they go and they get a client. And they're kind of sailing along and then one day they realize, oof, I still have a job, <laughs> right? Like they, and I, I think that's part of it, right? It's, it's the elastic band. They kind of snap back into habit. And I think that's what also gets them into trouble where they are now acting like the pair of hands as opposed to the brain behind the operation. 
because they get sucked into this kind of de facto employee-employer relationship, which is not the thing they were looking for, but it feels safe, right? It feels comfortable. It feels like a thing that I know and that I've known for years and years and years. And so, I, you know, it's really interesting and it's, it's fascinating and, and super fun when the light kind of goes on, right? And someone that we're working with says, oh no, what have I done, right? This is not the path I was headed down. So I can absolutely see why it happens. Um, the trick is to, you know, refocus on the prize, refocus on the end game and, uh, you know, get to a place where now you are back in control of how it is that you're working. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I never thought of it that way because a lot of people left, left corporate, left their jobs for a variety of reasons, but a lot of people left because they looked at their expertise. They looked at what they could contribute to the organization and they decided, I can get a better return, a higher yield on my expertise outside of this organization if I work with multiple organizations. That same logic applies if you have a whale client right now that makes up the majority of your revenue. There are like the other client, and, and you know, and, and if your results with that whale client are, are fantastic, that's great. This is less of a problem. Now your bigger problem is just simply concentration risk. What if they disappear? What if they get acquired? I know, oh, we've heard all the stories, right? <laughs> you, you and me, Carrie, we've, get, we've seen all the scenarios. Will client, because one of the biggest triggers for working with us is I had a will client, then I lost them or I fired them. And now I need to build a pipeline, enter 90 day pipeline. So client could get acquired. Your contact, your buyer, your decision maker could leave. New management takes over, makes different decisions. There's all kinds of reasons why you might lose that will client that have nothing to do with you. Well, or one that does have to do with you, which is you delivered the result, right? You solved the problem and weren't thinking far enough ahead to determine what happens when you solve the problem and you don't need to be there anymore. Ooh, you just went somewhere really interesting. How many consultants sabotage the results of their clients in order to create a dependency on them? Oof, that's interesting. They're never going to admit it. Nope. They're never going to admit it. And you listening, you're not going to admit it. But if you haven't framed the engagement around results and outcomes and outputs, and you framed it around inputs, we're going to come in and do this work for as long as possible. I'm sorry. You have a vested interest in that problem going unsolved and you maintaining a seat at that table for as long as possible. Which is potentially a good strategy to become really entrenched with a single client and never leave not a great way to build a business. Well, and it, what it also does is puts you in a position where, because I don't know that, I certainly don't think that many people are, you know, intentionally sabotaging, but at least not the folks we work with, but in the back of your mind, sure, you're kind of, you know, maybe not running as quickly as you can to the finish line. But I think the other challenge is, if you're doing a good job, and we see this all the time, right? You're doing a great job. You're you're heading towards that solution. Now, because you don't have other clients, the question is, ooh, what else can I do here? So now you start to dilute your expertise, right? Now you start to do the thing you're not really interested. Now you become the, you know, the jack of all trades, the person who's kind of filling in gaps because you're scrambling to find a place to, to stick so that the paycheck keeps coming. Whereas if you have others lined up behind, then you can, you know, move on, deliver that result again and, you know, put yourself in a position that is arguably also just way more fun, way more pleasant and way more aligned with what you, you set out to do in the first place. Self-preservation is a powerful thing, right? So a client comes to you and says, well, we're looking to execute this project and, you know, we have a couple of options on the table and one of them involves you and the other one doesn't. And to your point, if you don't have other stuff lined up, this is a, a big client that makes up a big chunk of your revenue and you need them to go your way to pay the bills. Otherwise, you're in a little bit of trouble. Uh, you know, I don't care how ethical you are <laughs> or, or how much integrity you have. You're going to, at the very least subconsciously, have a very strong bias towards the option that involves working with you, whether or not that is actually genuinely in the client's best interests. I remember I, I, when I was when I was doing a little bit more hands-on bespoke consulting work, I was working with a client. We worked together for about six months, and um, and we had a chat. And I said, I said, look, I think we need to do another three months together. And here's why: 
The team's not quite there yet. We've got this work left to do. We've got these problems left to solve. I said, and beyond that, uh, there's no reason why it should take longer than that. And we shouldn't continue working together beyond three months. And the client said to me, that just makes me want to work with you for longer. <laughs> Right? Because I was essentially terminating the agreement in advance and telling the client, this is our end point. And if we don't get there by then, this doesn't make sense for anybody. And that engenders trust. Yeah. And one of my favorite moments that happens with the clients that we work with. So, you know, they come to us, they're building a pipeline, they're starting to really go out and sell their solution, right? They're being able, they're able to raise their pricing, they're, you know, more effectively functioning. And they're often doing this alongside of the whale client, right? They're often doing this alongside of this work that has, that's been there, that maybe they were afraid they were going to lose, or maybe they realized they wanted to diversify more. And then the day comes where they look at that work and they just say, what am I even doing? <laughs> right? Why am I still there? That was the thing that I held on to for so, so, so long because it felt safe, because I felt valued, because of all of those things. But then they cross a line, right? There's a day, and this happens on calls, you know, very, very often where we're having the conversation and in front of us, they they light up, right? They have that realization. They think, huh, that's not a thing that makes sense for me anymore. And they walk away from the very thing that when they came to us was the thing, right? Was the anchor to their business, was the thing putting food on the table. And, you know, just the the freedom that comes from that and the excitement that they then have in their business is just, it's one of my very favorite things that ever happens. Yeah, 100%. So I think takeaway here for folks, this is a mindset. You know, yes, your track record, your, your, your case studies, your results are important. And you should aspire to deliver the very best results in your industry and to have a demonstrable track record of results you can point to. That's what clients want. That's what attracts the best clients. That's what enables shorter sales cycles. That's what enables higher fees and therefore higher profit margins. To get those results, you got to be really clear about who you want to work with and who you can get the best results for because all clients are not created equal. And the truth is every client's not going to be a runaway, you know, home run case study. And so you've got to qualify really, really hard, which requires opportunity, a pipeline choices. So maybe this is a good note to end on. Uh, our enrollment team is trained to only accept clients into 90 day pipeline who we believe are going to be case studies. And so we'll communicate this to people when they, when they book a, a consultation with our team. We will tell them, we are not looking for clients. Clients are easy to come by. We have lots of opportunity. We have many, many, many consultants who want to work with us. So if you fulfill the criteria of what might be a client that we can help or serve, that's table stakes. That doesn't get you in the room. That gets you to the conversation. Our real criteria is, will you be a case study? Not can we help you, see the difference? It's will you be a case study? Will you get fantastic results? Because like you, listener, we have limited supply. We have limited capacity. We've only so many people on our team that we can leverage to help our clients. So we wanna make sure that we're using our capability to its highest potential and working with clients that have the highest possible chance of getting great results. And I would suggest that ought to be your criteria as well. <laughs>